Yeah. Once again, I greet you on the master's name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Indeed, it, it's a great privilege in our life to come together in the presence of God to worship the Lord. Hallelujah. So uh, I'm so glad to uh, introduce uh, uh, our guest speaker today. Uh, we have uh, Pastor Toby uh, Montgomery with us from Auckland. And Pastor Toby uh, is a senior pastor of uh, the Church of God and currently serving uh, the Lord as a senior pastor of Christian uh, Cathedral Church in uh, Auckland. And uh, uh, Pastor Toby uh, is a well-known speaker of the of the Word of God and uh, he has been used by the Lord uh, uh, tremendously in many countries. Hallelujah. So, uh, you know, uh, when I was uh, I mean, speaking with him and he was saying that, okay, uh, I'm so eagerly waiting to uh, speak and preach to the, the Indian community. I mean, because uh, he was uh, he was one of the guest speaker of uh, IPC uh, Kubernetes uh, Convention uh, a few years ago, I believe. And, uh, uh, you know, myself and uh, uh, Jason and uh, uh, Jason and Alvin, my son, uh, got a chance to meet him and uh, uh, visit him, uh, his church also, uh, once few months ago. So uh, we are so uh, excited to hear from you, Pastor, today, this morning. And uh, and uh, we, as we are sitting in the presence of God, we are going to hear the word of God from, uh, I mean, uh, from the servant of God, Pastor Toby. And we are waiting for that. And uh, let's all put our hands together and welcome Pastor Toby in our midst this morning. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor, uh, so very much. And uh, thank you all uh, for, for uh, allowing me. And Pastor Sam Matthew, thank you for allowing me uh, the wonderful opportunity to share the word of the Lord with all of you. I've, uh, I've, I've put all of you on my screen so I can see you. So if you nod off, I'll know. And I just wanted to warn you of that, all right? So, <laughs> but, uh, and, I'll, and I'll call you out. And uh, No, I won't. But anyway, uh, I'm uh, very, very honored uh, to be with you. And as Pastor mentioned, I had the privilege of, of meeting uh, he and members of, uh, of his staff uh, just uh, before, uh, before these things uh, hit with the pandemic and, uh, and such. And it was such a, uh, an incredibly uh, gracious few moments that we were allowed to spend together. And so, Pastor, thank you very much. And, and I'm grateful to the Eternal Life Church uh, for allowing me to share with you. Uh, and and uh, in fact, I was, I was on my way uh, to India. I was one day uh, away. I was going to speak the commencement address at uh, uh, IPC Hebron Bible College in uh, in uh, in uh, Kumbana, and um, and uh, that's when uh, the Indian government uh, banned all large gatherings. So I was I was one day, <laughs> uh, and my my uh, my dear friend Pastor Valson Abraham was already uh, on, on in route and uh, and was in I believe it was uh, uh, Kuwait or or uh, one of the Gulf states rather uh, when he got the word so he went on into India and they had a smaller gathering for the commencement but uh, uh, so I, I plan to go there this year I have a ticket bought so I have to go there this year <laughs> and so <laughs> by, by the grace of God but uh, thank you for allowing me to be with you uh, if you have your Bibles I would be honored if you would turn with me uh, to the Gospel of Luke, the 22nd chapter. And as you're, as you're turning there, um, I, I just want to remind, oh, thank you so much, Pastor, for putting that up. Uh, I just, um, as you're turning there, I, I, want, I want to address today the prophetic element of what's taking place in the United States and in the nations of the earth. We certainly know that the pandemic is a global uh, um, undertaking. We understand that the nations of the earth are responding. And as I've shared with our congregation here, one of the things that you must always be aware of is if something is happening to every man, woman, and child on the planet, then you know that God is doing something in the midst of it. I, I, I'm not suggesting that he causes these kinds of things, uh, but he will not waste uh, any opportunity to extend his kingdom. And it is my, my firmly held belief that what the Lord is seeking to do, and I've been preaching on this locally, is, is very much as with Jairus and the woman with the issue of blood, 
that the Lord is, is healing his church. Uh, the number 12 is significant in that story. 12 means the totality of the community. And so the Lord is healing his church because the church for far too long has been hemorrhaging. The church for far too long has been seeking out counsel and wisdom and, 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 and assistance that is not from the Lord, but from others. And the Lord is calling us back uh, to his holy word. And he's calling us back to touching the tassel on the prayer shawl, the hem of the garment, and getting back into the word of God. Because what the Lord wants to do is awaken Jairus' daughter, again, 12 years of age, the totality of a generation, the generations to come, uh, that my children, my grandchildren, my, my great-grandchildren should that time come. The Lord is wanting to awaken and say, arise to this generation. But in the midst of all of this, and the Lord is using this, this season and this time to get our attention. But then we also had the uh, horrific situation in Minneapolis and uh, uh, the death of Mr. George Floyd, who lost his life at the hands of those who are sworn to protect and sworn to care for and sworn to serve in, in point of fact. And I have many members of my family and members of our church that are in law enforcement. And, uh, and I addressed this last Sunday to our local church. And I reminded them that in the ministry, we often have people who uh, their behavior, the behavior of, of some scandalize all of us. And we have to uh, accept that reality that even, even though we may not individually have done something wrong, when one of us in the clergy falls or, or, or violates the trust that God has given to us with the people of God, it affects all of us. It taints all of us to some degree. And, and law enforcement in the United States in particular must also accept what Jesus told us, that to whom much was given and to whom much responsibility is given, much is expected and, and much is, is required. And so we're in a season now in which, in which uh, calloused indifference and wrongful activity is rampant in our land. When those who are sworn to uphold the law violate the law, it undermines justice for all of us. Furthermore, while peaceful protestation is a wonderful right here in the United States, uh, we've also seen rioting, and, and rioting is not a right. Uh, peaceful assembly, peaceful protest is a First Amendment right. It's right in, in, in the United States Constitution. It is there with freedom of religion and freedom of the press. So it's, it's a hallmark of our, of our nation's history. But rioting is not okay. And what it did is it diminished the message of justice. And it diminishes the message of hope. And it diminishes the message of righteousness. In fact, it's brought even more death and violence and destruction here in Oakland and to other cities throughout our nation. According to the Associated Press, 11 individuals, a minimum of 11 individuals, have died as a result of this turmoil, have been killed as a result of this turmoil. The majority of those were from the African American community. And so the, the justice breeds, or injustice breeds injustice, violence breeds violence. Hatred breeds hatred. And so when the motivations or the actions, whether they're vile racism, sociopathic dehumanization, grotesque incompetence, callous indifference, calculated mob rage, or some horrific combination of these things, the fact is this nation is losing its soul. This nation is losing its sense of humanity. And I thoroughly believe that God is bringing to the United States the nations to help restore the soul and the heart of the United States. Acts chapter 17 makes it very clear that where we live and what time and season in which we live is ordered of God. That God chooses and decides where we will live. And he has chosen and decided when we would live. And so this is an hour and this is a moment not for us to shrink back. This is an hour and this is a moment not for us to be frightened. This is an hour and this is a moment not for us to, to, to uh, 
to diminish our responsibility. But it's also a moment in which the church of the Lord Jesus Christ must minister in the opposite spirit of this age. We must do things differently than the world does things. The only remedy for sin, whether it is the sin of violence, the sin of murder, the sin of theft, the sin of, of, of racism, and racism is a sin. The only remedy for these sins is the cross of Jesus Christ. The only remedy for a broken world is the cross of Jesus Christ. There is no other name given by which we can be saved. There is no other means offered by which sin can be atoned for. There is no other possibility that has been granted to us for sin to be removed and destroyed except Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, our Redeemer. So I believe that we come into a prophetic moment and within that prophetic moment, the enemy moves. And within that prophetic moment, the enemy tries to stop and move and, and hinder the work of God. The Last Supper of our Savior was a prophetic moment. It was a moment of transition, and it was a moment where the whole world was about to change. Within 24 hours of that meal, the universe would change. Within 24 hours of that meal, the creation and the created order would change. Within 24 hours of that meal, what Adam had lost, Christ was about to gain. Hallelujah. It was a prophetic and significant moment. And I believe that moment then speaks into this moment now. And so I want to read from Luke, the 22nd chapter, and set the table, pardon the pun, but set the table of the Lord's table a little bit. It says in verse 13 that they left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover, Luke 22, verse 14 now. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Again, verse 15, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he goes on, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in blood, which is poured out for you. And by the way, in the Passover Seder, this was the cup of redemption. The Lord took the cup, the cup of redemption, and changed its meaning, actually fulfilled its meaning. That this cup that the Jewish people had, had, had drank from for hundreds of years, was now the cup of the new covenant, hallelujah. For now it was not just a cup about redemption, it was the cup of the redeemer, hallelujah. And then he says in verse 21, but the hand of him who's going to betray me is with mine on the table. The son of man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves, which of them it might be who would do this? And look at verse 24 and just read it out loud, even in your rooms where you are, in your homes. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. Jesus said, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors but you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table 
in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. Hallelujah. But I have prayed for you. Hallelujah. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Father, we thank you for your word. Give us grace today. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom and insight. Grant the anointing of your spirit to fill our homes and our minds and our hearts. Father, grant that I, your servant, would speak only your word today. Father, let me not speak anything explicitly or implicitly that you are not saying. Put a guard over my mouth that I would not sin against you. Put a guard over my heart that I would reflect your heart today. And let these, your people, hear your voice, the voice of their shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, for this we thank you in the sacred and most holy name of your Son, our Lord Jesus. And everyone in agreement said, Amen. Amen. Seasons of change are always difficult, particularly when they are thrust upon you. The whole world and our nation right now are in dramatic days of change, and they've been thrust upon us in many ways. Even the Lord, the Lord has not necessarily caused it all. He's in it all. There are tribulations and trials and difficulties, and these types of seasons have a way of revealing our true selves in a manner in which days of prosperity and peace cannot. And sometimes, when we have to dig deep and see who we really are, we're not gonna like what we find. Sometimes our inner character is exposed in days of pressure that they would not be exposed in days without the pressure. But God is gracious. He'll never leave us to our own destruction. Even when the process is uncomfortable, the Lord will come and move in our midst. Right now, the nations of the earth are being exposed, and it's not all very good, frankly. It's a season of discipline. It's a season of correction. God is awakening his church, and he's raising up generations to serve him. But as he deals with our nation, and as he deals with the nations of the earth, as he's wanting to heal this nation and heal the nations of the earth, he looks to his people first. For the nations to be whole, the people of God must be whole. For the nations to be healthy, the people of God must be healthy. For the nations to come to righteousness, the people of God must come to righteousness. For Jeremiah said that we are called to seek the peace and prosperity of the city for which we've been carried into, even in exile. We pray the Lord for its prosperity. The Lord told Solomon, when I shut up the heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. If my people, hallelujah, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, hallelujah, and forgive their sin and will heal their land. It begins, my brothers and sisters, not with the politicians, not with the president, not with the mayor, not with the governor, not with all the people we want to we wanna say, oh, it's on you to fix this. No, 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 no. The Lord is not looking to them. He is looking to you and I, and he is saying, now is the time for my people to humble themselves. Now is the time for my people to take seriously what is going on in the world. Now is the time for my people to consider the violence and rage and pestilence that is in the land. And it's time for my people called by my name to call upon my throne, to humble ourselves in, 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 in true piety, to humble ourselves in true prayer and seek and crave and require necessity his face 
For as the Apostle Peter said, it is time for judgment, and judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Judgment does not begin in the White House. Judgment does not begin in the governor's mansion. God, judgment does not begin in the houses of the rich or of the poor. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. And it is the Lord that is coming. It is the Lord that is dealing with his people right now. Holiness would become a sin offering within 12 hours and 24 hours of this moment that, that, that Jesus is having with his disciples. The creator would about to be give his life for the created. Life itself would taste death. Holiness would become a sin offering. And the pressure of that moment revealed truth. He revealed truth about the disciples. It revealed truth about the adversary. And it revealed truth about our Lord himself. First, it revealed in the disciples, number one in your notes says, Pastor, if he's, if he's had the opportunity to distribute, if not, it's quite all right. But number one is, the, in the disciples, this pressure moment revealed a disturbing carnality. A disturbing carnality. The men who were entrusted with the gospel, the men who would become the foundation stones and pillars of the church, the men who we just read about, would actually judge the tribes of Israel. These men demonstrated a disturbing carnality. The heart of the Lord is always to be with us. The heart of the Lord is always to be near us. The heart of the Lord is to always be present toward us. In fact, in verse 15 of, of our text, he says, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. John said that there's a kind of extravagant love that the Father has sent to us. So picture this, my brothers and sisters. Here is our Savior longing, desperately, hungering to be with his brothers, to be with them. And instead of enjoying the moment, instead of savoring the moment, instead of run, recognizing the incredible change in the universe that was about to take place, They engaged in religious narcissism. They wanted to know who was to blame, and they wanted to know who was the greatest. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this, and a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. How callous, how indifferent, how insensitive, how spiritually numb, how carnal, how carnal. And yet how many of us engage in this type of activity ourselves? We view the Christian faith through the lens of self. We view the events of the day through the lens of self. We view the pandemic through what does it mean for me? We view the violence and the violations and we say, well, as long as it comes nigh me, I'm okay. Or it doesn't come nigh me. We're not seeing the Lord who is weeping. We're not seeing our brothers and sisters who are in need. We're not seeing the incredible desperation of the hour. In fact, we huddle into our own divisions. Paul told the Corinthian believers, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Say that out loud wherever you are. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized into the name of Paul? Of course not. How often? How often have our social media postings, how often have even our podcasts and our sermons, instead of being seasoned with love and grace and truth and mercy and righteousness and power, how often are they filled with accusation and slander? How often have we allowed unkindness? Well, pastor, what if my brother's wrong? We'll correct. We'll do it as Jesus said. 
one on one. And then if that doesn't respond, then we'll, we'll take another brother with us and we'll, we'll, we'll meet as God does with us in Isaiah. Come now, let's reason together. Then if that doesn't work, what do we do? Then we bring it to the church. But we don't display it for everybody. We don't walk in prideful arrogance because we get to correct somebody. In fact, we're supposed to be the utmost in humility in that moment. Look what Paul told the Ephesian believers in Ephesians 4. Don't let even one rotten word seep out of your mouth. Instead, offer only fresh words that build others up when they need it most. That way your good words will communicate grace to those who hear them. It's time to stop bringing grief to God's Holy Spirit. You've been sealed with the Spirit, marked as his own for the day of rescue. I believe the Holy Spirit is grieved right now by the behavior of the body of Christ. Of course he's grieved by the lost, but they're lost. If a dispute arose among the Pharisees as to which of them was the greatest, that would have been expected. Because it arose among those closest to the Lord, it's grievous. The Lord is grieved right now with the behavior of the church. Paul goes on to say, banish bitterness, banish rage, banish anger, banish shouting, banish slander, and any and all malicious thoughts. These are poison. Instead, be kind and compassionate. Graciously forgive one another, just as God has forgiven you through the anointed. He went on to the Thessalonian believers and he said, encourage, build one another up. Is it any wonder then on that very night, right after this meeting in the, in the Last Supper, when the Lord was in the Garden of Gethsemane, is it any wonder that he prayed these words in John 17? I ask, Father, not only for these disciples, but for those who will one day believe in me through their message. I pray for them all to be joined together as one. Even as you and I, Father, are joined together as one, I pray for them to become one with us so that the world will recognize that you sent me. For the very glory you've given to me, I've given to them so that they will be joined together as one and experience the same unity that we enjoy. You live fully in me, and now I live fully in them, so that they will experience perfect unity. And the world will be convinced that you have sent me, for they will see that you love each one of them with the same passionate love you have for me. Our carnality, our unwillingness, to love our brother and sister, our unwillingness to reach across the lines of division that the world is imposing causes the world to not see Jesus. We have been called to this great task of repenting of our own carnal nature, of our own carnality, of our own wickedness. Oh, as, as C.S. Lewis talked about, you know, the, the, the obvious sins the church is pretty good about avoiding. The obvious sins of the flesh that we talk about, the, the sins of, of lust, the sins of, 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 of lying, the sins of, of, of these uh, of things of, of, of theft and of, of, uh, of violence and violation. We, we, we avoid them and we're pretty good about that. It's the, it's the sins that are hidden. It's the attitude of our heart, the subtlety of our words, the pride of our own life. These are the carnal roots that are poison. And the church must repent. Oh, God's, God's going to deal with the White House and the governor's mansion and the Supreme Court. He'll deal with that. But right now he's dealing with us. And we have to repent of our carnality. The second thing that gets exposed in these kinds of pressure settings 
In the disciples, a disturbing carnality was exposed. But in the devil, in the adversary, a diabolical strategy was made known. A diabolical strategy. This is the same strategy we see today. The strategy to divide. The strategy to destroy. The strategy to sift. The strategy to toss to the wind. Separating and isolating. Jesus reveals it to the disciples that very night. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. Satan has asked to divide you. Satan has asked to scatter you. Satan has asked to bring destruction and devastation. Because this is what Jesus prophesied. When a kingdom is divided against itself, it cannot stand. It's what Jesus said of Lucifer. The thief approaches with malicious intent, seeking to steal, slaughter, and destroy. It's what Paul told us about, about the spirit of Antichrist already being in the world. And that we have a power and a calling to resist him. It's what John said. That the spirit of Antichrist is already moving in the, in the earth in 1 John 4, 3. And in 1 John 4, 4, a passage that all of us Pentecostal preachers have quoted a thousand times. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But my friends, it's in the context of a unified church resisting the spirit of darkness, resisting the spirit of this age, resisting the plan of darkness, resisting the strategy of hell. But how often do we not resist, but rather we succumb? We divide. We insist that we're right and our brother is wrong. We go to social media and we weaponize social media platforms. Rather than this great technology being used for good, rather than this great technology being used for hope and life and joy and peace and the spreading of the gospel, we want to celebrate our opinion. We want to celebrate how right we are and how wrong everybody else is. Oh, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Oh, how desperately we need the power of the living Christ. How desperately we need to war against the spirit of the age by ministering in the opposite spirit that this age is offering us. Oh, my friends, consider the little verse of Scripture in Jude, verse 9. A scriptural passage that most of us avoid because it just seems so oblique and odd. But here is a, a picture of Michael, the great archangel, wrestling with Lucifer over the body of Moses. And the Bible says that when he disputed about the body of Moses, he dared not bring against him a railing or reviling accusation but said simply, the Lord rebuke you. Hallelujah. The Lord rebuke you. Hallelujah. The Lord rebuke you. Oh, my friends, don't we understand that the enemy would love for you and I to engage in spiritual warfare with carnal means. The enemy would love for us to fight him through the arm of the flesh. The enemy would love for us to fight him through the arm of the world because that's his arena and he owns it. And even the archangel Michael would not rail against Satan. How often have I railed against a politician? How often have I accused the governor or the president or the mayor or somebody else? How often have I, been, have I, have I succumbed to spiritual warfare in the name of righteousness when I wasn't acting righteously? Oh, my friends, Jesus said, you can be sure of this, that when the day of judgment comes, everyone will be held accountable. Accountable for what, Pastor? For every careless word he has spoken. Your very words will be used as evidence against you or your words will declare you are either innocent or guilty. Oh, my friends, 2 Corinthians 10 says, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power 
to demolish strongholds. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Be supernaturally infused with strength through your life union with the Lord Jesus. Stand victorious with the force of his explosive power flowing in and through you. Put on God's complete set of armor provided for us so that you'll be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat is not with human beings, hallelujah, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. For they are a powerful class of demons and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Because of this, you must wear all the armor that God provides so that you're protected as you confront the slanderer, for you are destined for all things and will rise to be victorious. The Proverbs says that we're to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, that we're to ensure justice for those who are being crushed. Why would we speak with the voice of darkness? Why would we speak with the voice of damnation? Why would we speak with the voice of carnality? Why would we contribute to the sifting plan of darkness when the Lord has called us to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves? What will you say? Will you speak words of death or words of life? Will you speak words of destruction or words of hope? Will you speak words of, 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 of violence and violation, incitation and cruelty, unkindness? Or will you speak the words of truth and grace, seasoned with salt, offering the word of God? Because you see, my friends, there's something else revealed in this moment. Our carnality, of course, the enemy's plan. But there's something about the Lord that is being revealed. And that is, number three, a disproportionate authority. An authority that doesn't look like authority. A power that doesn't seem like power. Why would we abandon the weapons of the spirit for the weapons of the world? Because we haven't believed in the power of the spirit. Because we haven't believed in the power that the Lord has offered and rendered to us. Simon, Simon, Jesus said, Satan has asked to sift all of you as we. Hallelujah. But I have prayed for you. Hallelujah. I have prayed for you. All oh, my friends, right now, in, in, in 2020, this world, right now, in, the, in 2020 America, in 2020 India, in 2020 uh, the continents of the earth, right now the enemy is seeking to sift. He's seeking to divide. He's seeking to destroy. And there's a part of all of us that thinks, oh, is this, the, is this it? Are we not going to come out of this okay? Is the Lord's name not going to be glorified? It's easy to let fear into the house. But I remind you today, hallelujah, the Lord has prayed for us. The Lord has a power that is disproportionate to the age. It's greater than anything the age has. It's greater than every weakness of hell. It's greater than any onslaught of darkness. It's greater than any scheme and plan of man oh beloved the lord has prayed for us we will not fail because our redeemer lives and our redeemer is interceding and our redeemer is standing in the gap even now hallelujah we have power from on high our redeemer is working in the earth right now and he's calling us to the disproportionate power spiritual energy of unity of prayer, of coming together. Hallelujah. Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It's like precious oil of consecration coming down on the head, running down on the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his priestly robes, consecrating the whole body. 
It's like the dew of Hermon was descending upon the hills of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing. Hallelujah. What is the blessing? In fact, every Sunday since this began almost, I've had the, the worship team sing that, that new song, which is an old song. Uh, the, the words are old, but the, new, the, the song is new, The Blessing by Carrie Job and her husband. And I've been saying it because I want, to, I want to declare this prophetically into the earth. Well, what is the blessing? Life, hallelujah. Life, hallelujah. Life, hallelujah. The giver of life is speaking life over the earth right now. Now, how does that ha happen for you and I? He's looking for agreement in the earth. He's looking for you and I to agree with him. He's interceding. He's looking for someone in the earth to say, yes, Lord. Amen, Lord. Yes, we will proclaim. Yes, we will do. Yes, we will act. Yes, we will not wage warfare weapons of this world. We will not engage in the in the trite, the trivial, the dehumanizing, and the cruel. We will stand for those who cannot stand. We will speak for those who cannot speak. But we're not going to speak a politician's words. We're not going to speak a man's words. We're not going to speak our ideas. We're not going to speak a philosophy of the age. We don't care what the Democrats say or what the Republicans say. We want what the Lord Lord Jesus Christ is saying, and he is speaking life, hallelujah, life, hallelujah, life into the earth. Oh, beloved, we are called to this moment. Blessed be his name. Blessed be his name. Blessed be his name. I assure you, Jesus said in Matthew 18, whatever you bind, forbid, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose, permit, declare lawful on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. Do you understand the power of agreement? The power of agreement between heaven and earth. The power of agreement between you and the word of God. When you say in prayer, thus saith the Lord, and you declare, Satan, you cannot have my children. You cannot have my grandchildren. You cannot have our church. You cannot have our city. You cannot have our nation. You cannot have the nations of the earth. This is the word of God. This is the will of God. You are lining up with God. And he's saying, I am already speaking now. When you're silent, or even worse, when you become the mouthpiece of hell, you are working contrary to the Spirit of God. It's a sobering reality. For he went on to say in verse 19, I say that if two believers on earth agree, that is, are of one mind, in harmony, about anything that they ask within the will of God, it will be done. Hallelujah. I have prayed for you, he said. It will be done. For where two or three are gathered in my name. Hallelujah. Meeting together as my followers. Hallelujah. I am there. Hallelujah. Oh, it's disproportionate. It doesn't seem like it should work. It seems like it's only one or two or three, but he said one can put a thousand to flight. Hallelujah. Two can put 10,000 to flight. Hallelujah. It's a disproportionate anointing, but it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So what do we do? We love our neighbor as ourselves. We love our God. We serve one another. We understand that this is a supernatural endeavor. The enemy is seeking to destroy. We must speak and seek and live in the opposite spirit. We must understand that the ministry of Jesus is a supernatural ministry. The ministry of Jesus is a ministry of deliverance. The ministry of Jesus is a ministry of power. Matthew 10, 7 and 8. The kingdom is here. Bring health to the sick. Raise the dead. Touch the untouchables. Kick out the demons, hallelujah. Kick out the demons, hallelujah. Kick out the demons, hallelujah. You've been treated generously, live generously. What about those opposed? What about those agents of darkness? Jesus had a word for them too. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. If that's not ministering in the opposite spirit, I don't know what is. 
what takes place is you, el you eliminate the power of darkness to fight in that moment. Because in that moment, you are acting as the son of God. For this is what Jesus did. And this is what Jesus does. And when his presence is manifest, every knee will bow. Hallelujah. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So the son of God came into our world to destroy the plague of destruction. We must do what Jesus would do in the way that Jesus would do it and in the power that is necessary to destroy the plague of destruction inflicted on the world. May the Lord revive his church. May the Lord heal our land. For he said, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing, even greater things than these. Disproportionate anointing, a disproportionate power. Oh, you have an anointing as an individual believer. Your pastor has an anointing as a believer and then as a servant of the Lord called into the office of pastor. There's an anointing that comes with that office. The bishop has an anointing in that office. But don't you understand, my friends? Our collective anointing as the body of Christ is greater than any single person's anointing. Hallelujah. 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 When the body of Christ will be united, the flowing oil like on Aaron's beard. Hallelujah. The flowing oil, like on Aaron's beard, flowing from top to down, from the head, our master, the Lord Jesus Christ, all the way down, hallelujah, to the body and even touching the earth itself. This is our calling. This is the moment. This is what God is asking. Yes, even more so, this is what God is requiring of us. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we repent of our carnality. We repent of our flesh-driven attitudes. We repent of our flesh behavior. We repent of the words we have spoken. We repent of the attitudes we have had. We repent, Lord, where we have looked cynically and narrowly upon our brother. We repent where we've not stood for those who cannot stand. We repent where we've not spoken for those who cannot speak. But Lord, we also repent for where we have spoken and stood, but not in the name of the Lord. But we've actually echoed the voice of darkness. Have mercy on us, O God. Forgive us our great sin. And heal your church, that your church might heal your land. We give you thanks. Anoint us, anoint us, anoint us. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank, Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor. Hallelujah. And thank you, congregation. Uh, I'm very blessed to have been with you this morning. I, I'm, I'm honored. Thank you so much. God oh. bless you, Pastor. Thank you so much for accepting our uh, uh, our invitation and uh, sharing the word, the, the real I mean, word of God. Thank you, Pastor. Real word of God with us this morning. And uh, we know that you're a little bit uh, busy today. Uh, and you have to preach to your people also you today. To walk so, in and preach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We are, we are so blessed by your message, and we'll Thank be you. continually praying for you. Thank Please you. God. Thank you very much. Bless